It's time for the movie raid, and tonight's victim is Nathan Thomas Milliner, film director, comic book writer, and as well as artist. Hello. Hello, how you doing? Have you done several projects, including uh, The Confession of Fred Krueger, including Wish for the Dead, Girl Number 3, and Volumes of Blood. Uh, what's going on with these projects? Oh, well, some of them are old and dead and gone, and some of them are new. Uh, Girl Number 3 was the first film I ever did back in 2009, based on a comic book I'd written and drawn. I, didn't, I just wrote the screenplay on that one. And did a few other things in it. Uh, Wish for the Dead was my directorial debut, which I made back in, I don't know, about three, four years ago. So, Volumes of Blood is a new thing. It's just premiered back in March, and it's a an horror anthology made by Verite Cinema, and I was uh, one of the writer and directors on it. It's kind of a throwback anthology and a Tell from the Crypt, a creep show kind of thing. And uh, Confession of Fred Krueger, just this thing that I had, a fan film that I had written a couple years ago that I kind of moved forward with after working on uh, Volumes of Blood. I met a lot of great, talented people on that movie uh, the perfect actor to take over Fred Krueger I kind of was inspired by him really to go ahead and put this thing into action because it's been sitting around for about two or three years now taken from comic book to film do you think artists should have that kind of full control in terms of rectorial uh, vision uh it just depends on this artist under certain the writer understands how film works because every time I, I, de I adapted two of my comics to film and every time I had to change things because while the mediums are very alike, they are very different. There are things you can do on a comic you just can't do on a film. Length is, a, is an issue. You, know, you only have a certain amount of time on a film as opposed to your comic. There's just some things that just don't work cinematically. You know, Sin City was probably the most faithful adaptation of a comic book, but a lot of film people will tell you that movie doesn't really work as well as if they hadn't stuck so strictly to mimicking the book. You know, nobody knows the material better than the writer, but, you know, when you're a writer and you're in the movie industry, you've got to realize that your vision is going to be taken and changed. That's one of the reasons I've really never gone into screenwriting, even though I've written some screenwriting stuff or screen scripts. I never went into it professionally because I realized that whatever you write is going to end up being rewritten and taken apart. And sometimes 15% of what you wrote actually ends up on your screen. Yeah, you can always play with a comic book when, when it comes to the film adaptation. You can put things here and there, but some a lot of times it doesn't look really good at all. It's just, it's mixed. It has nothing to do with it. And there are people that may have not even seen the comic book or even read about the, the story of it. And they're, they're not going to get it unless you explain something about it. Yeah, you hear comic book fans will complain, oh, we don't need another origin story or we don't need all that. The rule of thumb in comic books as well, and I don't know if fans don't know this, but if you'll notice if you read a comic book series, every four to five or six issues, they will mention the origin story. They'll tell you what Batman's origin story was or what Spider-Man, and that's because the rule of thumb is that every comic book is somebody's first comic book. They don't know it. You can't just assume that everybody knows, has read issue 247 of Thor. You know, they haven't. When a filmmaker has to adapt something that has 50 years of history, which is what they're doing with all these comic book movies, you know, they have to consider not just the fans but the person on the street who has no knowledge of any of this stuff and how do you choose what do i mean you've got hundreds and hundreds of stories and plot lines and villains and you know i think the best example i heard was um kenneth brana said that you know he could go into a comic-con and have seven thousand of the biggest Thor fans in the world and they could tell him what they want to see and he'd get 7,000 different movies. But I can't make 7,000 movies. I can make one movie and hope that everybody likes it. Do you think it actually ruins uh, the comic book experience for those that hasn't even touched a comic book in life, but yet they go see it? I mean, like copying it or just... Yeah. What was wrong? But they know that it's more uh, adaptation rather than being specifically from the uh, comic book. Basically, does it ruin for fans of the book when they see it? I mean, that, that's one of the biggest pet peeves now is that you know, there's so much negativity and hate towards anything that's being adapted from any kind of popular material or entity you know i'm dealing with that with freddy right now every every freddy fan has their own opinion on who freddy is or what his past was or what the character is or who should play him blah 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 and if anybody does anything that isn't directed to their personal feeling or their their idea the visions in their head you know like when the x-men movie came in i would hear people say well it wasn't like the x-men cartoon in the 90s i'm like well you know the series was around for 30 years before that cartoon right you know there the people say well that's not my batman that's not my batman i'm like there have been literally a hundred different batmans you know they're, they're every writer who's taken them on since 1939 has done something different with him. He's constantly, and he started out killing people and breaking guys' necks and stuff and throwing them off buildings. Then he got Robin and turned all kind of happy-go-lucky good guy. And then the 70s became more realistic, more of a detective. And all these things go through their incarnation.
emotions and depending on when you came to that character or that storyline that's what you fall in love with and that's how you see it forever that's the image you fall in love with is that first taste when these kids or these people they're looking at a movie that's being based on a comic book that they've read since they were a child the images that they remember from their childhood is the images that they love most and if anybody screws with that yeah it definitely bothers them but they don't understand that even before they came to it their character had been messed with and changed over and over and over yeah and seeing it on on film they it's, it comes to the market value where it's such a popular character they just make it a face on a soda can and it becomes to the point it's like this is not even a character anymore it's like something you look on a cereal box yeah i mean every new generation stories from the beginning of time have been retold and retold and retold you know this new star wars series that will come out you know a lot of my people my, from my generation i grew up on star wars and the prequels rubbed a lot of fans the wrong way but there's a whole generation of kids who grew up on those three that have no problem with them in the world so it's, it's all about what you fall in love with same reason you get fans in the horror genre who see a remake of a horror movie they loved when they were 10 the new remake may be just as guilty of the bad things that the original movie had like anyone who says that the Friday the 13th had great acting is, is lying to themselves. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, they, they go and they attack the new movie saying, oh, the acting was horrible. Like, did you see the original Friday the 13th movie? Uh, you know, you had this magical prestige or perfection in your head. And we all, we're all guilty of it. We all fell in love with something at impressionable ages. And anything different is kind of hard to accept. Yeah, it's based on impression. It, it's always been based on that. It, it, as time keeps going, and as long as I keep taking these popular characters from way back when and then enhancing 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 to the point it's like is there going to be any more story to this character anymore they're just going to keep enhancing even further and further and keep on remaking and keep on more prequels like how many times we're going to tell the exact same story a thousand times yeah and it really is film for the last at least 60 years has been centered around youth in the 50s and 60s the driving culture and the teen culture everything in the media is geared towards teenagers and young people so it only makes sense that you're going to have to reinvent or retell these things. It's just that's how it's always been. People don't realize, they don't think about that. That's, you know, Dracula was recycled in the 50s. All the Universal Monsters were recycled then. Uh, Batman, you know, was told, you know, they made a serial in the 30s or 40s. And then Tim Burton brings his movie out, or even, you know, the 60s, the 60s TV show. And, you know, Tim Burton movies. And, you know, things just are retold and redone for each generation because there's always a new audience being born and who are the ones who buy stuff. They're not marketing Batman movies to 40 or 50 year old guys to market them towards kids that they can sell toys to. You know, I hear people say, oh, they should make a Power Rangers movie that's all brutal and violent. Like, who's going to go see that? <laughs> you know, they can't do that. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense. Step back and realize that what you are complaining about are kid movies. Star Wars, Ninja Turtles, they were made for kids. They're still kids, you know, material. Yeah, if it was originally made for that, chances are there's not going to be a whole lot of change when you're taking something that was nice and light and friendly and then you end up taking it a more a darker path it could totally just change the entire realm of, of that uh, saga of what they created and just completely make it into something that, that it's not and never was I mean Turtles is an interesting thing because the comic book was extremely brutal and violent and adult and then they turned it into a, a popcorn thing for kids cartoons and, and that became what most people knew of it because they didn't read those underground comic books that were made in the early 80s so they didn't know about the violent bloody blood soaked Ninja Turtle comic books that started it off they saw the cartoon, the you know, morning serial stuff, and that's what they know of Turtles. Since you've directed independently, do you think it's better way to invest into your future projects? Well, in terms of money, do you think it's best to, to be on your own? I don't know. I mean, I haven't been on the other spectrum of that. I mean, independent film, there's anything independent, there's no money to be made. Uh, comic books, I did those for years independently. Uh, you're basically just throwing money away. I mean, this fan film that I'm making with Freddie, I mean, I paid for it out of pocket, and I can't sell it because I don't own anything of it. So it's free. I got to put it out there for free, and that's why I made it. I'm not making it for profit, uh, and I'm fine with that because I just want to make it out of love for the material. I've been in love with this series for 25 years or more, and with independent comics, there's nobody buys anything new. You go to a comic book convention, and someone's like, well, do I pay this guy over here $5 for his comic book that I've never heard of and is probably garbage, or do I go buy that new Spider-Man action figure I really want that's exclusive? And so usually they're going to buy the Spider-Man action figure instead of giving you $5 for your comic book that nobody knows about. And in the, in the industry, as far as film and comic 
comics and so forth. Well, it's basically that anybody and everybody can make something now, and that's a great thing and it's a bad thing because you get lost in the sea, and people just automatically assume that what you're doing is going to be crap because it's not official, it's not a studio, it's not Marvel or DC. Uh, so they just think, well, if it was worth my time, then you know it would be in movie theaters, or if it was worth my time, it would be at my local comic book shop. Yeah, in some cases, having less money to make a, a decent film can benefit greatly or it's it's also a gamble too but in some cases making an independent film with less money or you know, a less bigger budget can actually uh, benefit rather than you know, just be suffering about it yeah i mean with having less money the, you know the, the old saying is it helps you become more creative uh you know look at sam raimi make an evil dead a lot of that stuff was so innovative because he just had to think around problem and it, and when you stop to think about something how can i do this practical versus cgi you know nightmare on street the scene where he comes through the wall in the original movie was a ten dollar effect the guy went and said hey they got this new thing called spandex he bought the spandex and the way you light it looks like freddy's coming through the wall and it's amazing but it's just a piece of ten dollar spandex on like stretched out whereas in the remake you know they cgi'd it and it looks awful looks fake i mean the, the cool thing about independence is especially versus Hollywood now. Hollywood, they're so scared of failure and they're so scared of taking chances that they wait for the independents to make those risks and take those risks and those chances. And as soon as an independent film, like a paranormal activity that's made for like, what, $11,000 or I can't remember how much it was made for, really, really, really cheap, that movie does really well. And then they're like, okay, what else do we have on our desk that we haven't touched, that paranormal activity-ish? And then they go make those for five years until the well runs dry. With independence, you don't have to, you're not tied down to what is selling or what money people tell you is going to sell. You don't have to worry about them telling you what to do and what to change because that's not going to sell. You know, I work in the art industry doing cover art, and I know for a fact that the horror fans and the the fans out there love the new illustrated covers because that's what they grew up on. That's what always sold movies. But distributors and movie studios believe that illustrated movie art and movie posters are old-fashioned and do not sell. So that's why we get so many uninspired and really boring and crappy photoshopped photographs on movie posters now. I mean, most of the movie posters that come out today, I wouldn't have on my wall. Yeah, the, the artwork is is awesome when it comes to, like, you see it on your DVD cover, you see it on your even VHS box. Seeing these older posters with with beautiful artwork, you're representing not just the film, but you're re- representing the artist who did that, who in part does tell the story before you even watch the film itself. You can tell what the story is about just by looking at this artwork. Oh, yeah, you look at something like your Struz and stuff in the 80s, you know, the Big Trouble in Little China poster, and it's giving you a story. It's giving you so much richness. It draws interest. That's that's the point of it. It draws interest. It draws, yeah, it shows you that you're going to see something really cool. And today, if Big Trouble Little China came out, you would basically see Kurt Russell standing there, photoshopped against the big explosion behind him, and the title written there, and Kurt Russell's name written on top, and that would be it. You'd be like, oh, because like, um, I always use the example of the, the Tom Cruise movie, Jack Reacher, that came out. It's just Tom Cruise standing there with a gun and a jacket looking at you with a, with like a black background or something in the background and just says, Tom Cruise, Jack Reacher. I'm like, what the hell is this movie about? I have no idea. I just know it's Tom Cruise and it's called Jack Reacher. And he's got a gun in his hand. Like, where's the story? Where, how are you getting it? I mean, basically you're just telling me, hey, Tom Cruise is in this, come see it. And yeah. it's, that's, that's how they market stuff now. Yeah, it, do you think it's almost a little bit of a dying form now? Because now that you do see see these types of posters yeah i think i'm hoping that there's a switch i'm hoping that people are paying attention to what the fans are buying and what they're excited about uh you know they're they're just released a uh poster for krampus the new movie that's the guy that followed up his trick-or-treat movie about christmas christmas anthology movie and this beautifully illustrated old school movie poster and the first thing i said was man that's gorgeous that won't end up in movie theaters or on my my dvd copy of it you know comic-con they'll they'll do it because the, the fan base there is into art and is into that stuff geek culture but the masses i don't know if it's just they don't want to pay an artist to do it or i really don't know half of these things get thrown together by some graphic artist that's on their payroll already that's why you end up getting like a nightmare on street blu-ray set with uh you know of the original films with jack Earl haley on the cover You're like what happened there how was the remake representing the original series on blu-ray it's like they're either doing that subliminally to sell you their new remake that they've invested money in or just laziness and not or n- no information about what they're selling somebody just googled nightmare on street and pulled a picture off 
line and used it on the cover. Little details mean a big, big difference. <laughs> oh, to fans especially. The fans know, they know everything. Fan, like Horror fans, horror fans know who the extras are in movies. They know who the makeup artist was. They know who the composer and who, and they know every detail. They know the dialogue. Geeks, uh, you know, comic books, sci-fi, all that. They know these movies frontwards and backwards and you can't get one over on them. The details are, I mean, I've had fans write me complaining, uh, yeah, Jason Voorhees is right-handed. Why do you have a knife in his left hand? <laughs> I've had that, and it's like, that's how detailed they are. Jason Voorhees is not a left-hander. He's a right-hander. Get it right. <laughs> it, it is true. <laughs> and, that's what, and that's how crazy it gets, and that's what you have to respect, is that somebody loves these movies. Every movie has a fan. It has fans who love that movie, and it's your responsibility to understand that and respect that when you have to represent it. And rather than having a, a well-known celebrity, I mean, granted, yep, there's, there's great artists out there, great actors that can portray these type of characters, but when you had an existing character and a person who's played this existing character for so long, or even characters, it, it becomes to the point where you're going to just drive fans away from this film because it's not what they are. They, they can never act... Or not not saying that they, they, they don't even want to replace this person, but they, they can never act the same way in this character as they did back in the 80s and 70s and so forth. Yeah, you got to let an actor make it their own. No actor trains and trains and trains to just basically mimic another actor's performance. No, it's, the, it's like telling an artist just to trace over another artist's artwork. It's but, just, it's pointless. Well, and to, but I, why would I bother? Like, I need to put my stamp on this, otherwise there's no point in me doing it. Basically about experience for the, for this actor, because of this actor, he or she wants to take on this challenge, because it is a big challenge. Every role is a big challenge, regardless of how big or how small it is. You have to play it right, you have to get it out there. You have to show these people that they this is the character that you are playing. Even if you are just standing by a streetlight reading the newspaper, you gotta act like you're doing that. Yeah. But where do you, where do you think the motivation? What type of motivation do you think is best to keep going as far as filmmaking or even artistry? I always say that artists are like sharks. If we stop moving, we're gonna die, and that's really how it is. Like I I just keep moving forward. You know, despite critics or fans or whatever, if people love me or hate me. You just gotta keep moving forward and keep creating because that's just what you are. It's it's part of who who we are, and we're not going to be deterred from it for by anything. Uh, I'll be drawn to the day I die. Uh, and motivation also for artists are just to get better at what you do. Every day you need to be learning and pushing yourself, and that's really what most artists care about is just getting better and better and improving. Not for everybody else, but for themselves, because we're our, our own worst critics, and we don't ever think that we're where we want to be. And if you start believing that you're where you're at your end of your line, then you need to quit. But you know, you have to keep pushing. Now, Bradley Cooper said something really cool on the Inside the Actor Studio about fame and, and all that. And he said, you know, with the Hangover movies and all that, he became more famous. But that just became more of a problem or burden than really making him feel like he had accomplished anything. He said he's no different than when he was when he was just a student at the Actor Studio trying to get better. And that's all he's doing now is just trying to get better. That's all he cares about. To me, that's totally how I look at art is that I just want to keep getting better. And uh, once I get into people recognizing my work, it just makes me want to even push it further because I have something to live up to now. I have to be better. And then I have my, my colleagues, you know, the people who are also in this industry that are doing really well. I have to stay up with them. I have to keep up with those guys. And they, we all motivate each other to push each other to do better and get better. We have to keep creating because it's just part of who we are. If, we, if we're not creating, we're, you know, we don't sleep. We don't think of anything. We're all, it's 24-7 brain is always in a creative mode and you just have to make films you have to write you have to draw you have to sculpt whatever your craft is you need to do it always because you're never going to go anywhere if you don't but you know as a personal thing you just want to improve improve and see how far you can push it let's go into fred krueger uh since making this it did spark some interest to a lot of people and uh from seeing the the trailer available it seems like you focus more on the human side but yet darker side of, of Freddy Krueger himself because it shows that he he comes to this town and he says he says himself saying that he is nothing but he can be something and he'll be your serial killer. Yeah, he says um, I, from day one I was destined to be no one and the cop tells him well we are who we, who we make of ourselves and he says I made myself the Springwood Slasher. My idea with Freddy and you know again that goes back to what I was saying about when you 
specifically come to a series, that's your idea. And when I came to the series, it was 1988, and the first four films had come out. And I really loved the darker, scarier Freddy's. He kind of took a turn in three and four to more humorous, but he was still still kind of dark and sinister. It wasn't until after 88 that he just became a cartoon character. And so I fell in love with that dark, scary character. Who this guy was intrigued me. And there was a book called The Nightmare on Street Companion that I got that had an origin story in there written by Jeffrey Cooper. And it talked about how he was a drifter and nobody and he came to town and um, kind of found motivation. And also I pulled it from Robert England. Robert England had said that when he was on set or when he was in the makeup chair one day on the first movie, he was sitting there getting all that makeup put on him, all that sea white jelly basting on him to make him look nasty and oozy. You know, just miserable, covered in this crap. Here he is, he's like pushing 40, he's a character actor. He's, he's not going to be a leading man actor, he's, his, his time is going by him. And he's sitting in this, you know, makeup chair getting all this crap put on him. And he looks over and he sees 20-year-old Johnny Depp and 20-year-old Heather Langenkamp. And they're just these beautiful, young, gorgeous young actors who have their whole careers and lives ahead of them. And they're starring in this movie. And he's you now playing this nasty, dirty, covered in makeup bad guy. And he said he kind of resented them. He kind of felt jealousy and envy towards them and hatred because he was never going to be them. And he said he used that to motivate him to play Freddy. And I, I latched on to that. And I was like, that's who Freddy is. He's someone who resents the pretty people and the beautiful people that he was never allowed to be in life. You know, Freddy was an orphan. He was beaten. He was bullied. He was treated like garbage his whole life. He was poor. He had no money. He lived on the streets. He was homeless. He comes to Springwood and it's this picture-perfect white picket fence Burbia with all these beautiful, happy people and beautiful, happy children who have a whole future ahead of them that he's never had a chance to have. And that's what motivates Freddy to do what he does is, okay, I can't be like them, so I'm going to hurt them and I'm going to take from them everything. I'm going to ruin their lives. Yeah, when it comes to what fan-made films like this usually like again what we mentioned rearranging things so it's like well i think he should be doing this and this and sometimes it works and sometimes it just really don't work out when you're when you're doing this and of course the uh, the story itself it has still has to be in place but i mean you could enhance it you could you know change some things around but as long as it's to to where everyone still recognizes what everyone has always recognized who freddy krueger is it's really hard to tap into who freddy krueger is because robert changed the character and the filmmakers change the character and story every film like if i always say like the people who don't think that i'm really staying on on board i mean this movie is strictly based on the first movie there's a little bit of things from the series that pop in there like springwood the, springwood didn't come along until part two um there's a lot of other things that didn't come in until later uh if you put my movie next to the original film it's going to look much more like the original film than if you put the original film next to freddy's dead or freddy versus jason or one of those films because that's how far and he evolved into something that he really wasn't from the beginning. Uh, so it's it's kind of hard. How do you take all of those different varieties? Kind of like I said about Batman. Who is Batman? Is he the, the psychopathic, crippling, killing guy that he was in the beginning who carried a gun? Or was he the campy 60s Adam West Batman? Or was he the O'Neill Adams Batman of the 70s? Or was he the Burton campy dark or the Frank Miller? or the Christopher Nolan, who is Batman? There is no definitive Batman because he's been different things over the last 75 years. Same with Freddy. Freddy can constantly change. He was not who he was in the original film. And I just decided, all right, I'm picking the one I want to do. And if I'm making a prequel, then I'm going to follow the first movie because that's the one that I, I gravitate towards more. That's the guy. I can't tell the real life story of, a, of the cartoon in Freddy vs. Jason. That's not or not, not not that one but uh, Freddy's dead it's a different Freddy altogether it's a different character a different person he's a caricature he's not really alive I'm wanting to make kind of a seven Silence of the Lambs type film here where I have a real life human being who's a serial killer who ch murders children I can't make him a comic book or a cartoon he has to be scary he has to be real now seeing after all the old school films including the remake would you consider this film that you made a little bit more realistic or a better insight of what Freddy really is and not just fan uh, suggestion it just depends on the individual what they like you know there are people out there who prefer the funny Freddy or prefer the scary Freddy you know it comes down to who's who, who it is or what you want or how you perceive it I, I keep saying this about this film is that I can only make the guy that I see in my head because it's my perspective and you can take a 
again, like Bronna said, I could take 100 greatest or biggest Nightmare on Street fans in the world, ask them, who is Freddy Krueger? What is a Nightmare on Street to you? What do you love about it? What do you not love about it? And you will get 100 different versions. I can only make the movie that I can make because it's coming from my perspective. And I understand when I do that, it's not going to gel with everybody else. Everybody else has their own opinions or visions of who this guy is or how this story is. I just want people to realize it's made by a fan who loves it and is just telling his perspective of it hopefully you like it rather than just forming an angry book club <laughs> yeah i mean it's just you know when you see fans get so up in arms i used to be that guy when i first heard about the nightmare on street remake you know my first instinct was okay you can you can put anybody in a hockey mask or a shatner michael myers mask but you can't replace freddy krueger robert played him eight times and on television for 20 years you just can't replace that man but you know i'm making a fan film i can't hire robert england <laughs> my movie costs nothing my hope was okay I, I i'm making a prequel and we really other than some of the you know sequels where you'd see flashbacks we don't know who freddie was or what he was like to me freddie was this vile disgusting evil person that you didn't want to spend any amount of time with he looked like he just pulled him out of hell which he, he did he lived in the boiler room you know, later movies they added where he had a wife and he had a daughter and he had a house on in Elm Street or in Springwood. And I just felt that that was a wrong move compared to what Wes Craven had created. Freddy just didn't belong in that world. And, you know, people don't realize, you know, they don't recognize that Freddy versus Jason didn't mention the wife or daughter at all. Robert England just talked about the prequel that they were going to make. John McNaughton, who did Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, had written and they were trying to get made. And that movie also disregarded the wife and daughter thing. It just depends on the individual. If, if, you, if you're in, in so in love with your idea of Freddy, and you should be because that's your idea of him, then you're going to reject everything unless you're open-minded and say, hey, well, hey, you know what, it's just a fan, it's just fan fiction. Take it for what it is. You know, don't take it so seriously. Now, is there any other projects that you have released right now or anything that's actually going to be on DVD? Oh, Volumes of Blood... Uh, it's going to be hitting DVD. So I, I directed one of the segments and wrote uh, one it's called um, Encyclopedia Satanica, one of the five stories in it. And a lot of the team that made that made this Fred film. Kevin Roach, who plays Freddy in my new movie, he played the antagonist in that movie. It was on that movie that I saw the potential for him to play Freddy. I don't, I don't know any dates, it's, you know, although you never know when these things are actually going to get released once distributors take it over. But that one is playing in festivals, and uh, you can see trailers of that online. Uh, as far as other projects film-wise, um, we are talking about The Volumes of Blood 2, um, maybe next year. I have a, a feature film that I'm prepping, another kind of psychological horror film. I've been kind of calling it kind of um, No Country for Old Men meets um, The Wicker Man. You know, it's not exactly like those movies, but it's in that vein. It's kind of a southern fried uh, cops, weird backwoods kind of thing. Kind of pumping, pumpkin head. I, I, I grew up in Kentucky. I live in Kentucky, so a lot of the horror stories I wrote and gravitated towards when I was younger were rural. I don't live, I would live in the city, but I would visit family in the country, and it is, it's just a different atmosphere, and it's always kind of creepy. So stuff like Stephen King, I grew up watching him in the 80s, like reading his books, and he wrote a lot of, you know, backwood stuff, or country-based, like, you know, the, the people in, a, I guess, small town horror, basically. And that's kind of what I wanted, I've always wanted to make something like that. Uh, and that's kind of a genre I haven't done, because Girl Number 3 was kind of a slasher film. Well, go ahead and plug in any web addresses, or even adre web addresses that relate to the projects that you are currently doing. Oh. Volumes of Blood has an official page on Facebook, mostly on Facebook, like Fred, Expression of Fred Kruger does. Everything else, I don't have anything up yet for. Um, the little feature film is called uh, The Dark and Bloody Ground. Uh, I'm not sure when I'm going to move forward on that, if I do. There's another comic book I did a long time ago. It's kind of a crime noir, somewhere in the vein of The Crow at Meets Sin City um, and old noir crime stuff. Most of the stuff I work on is just the art stuff, working for Horror Hound and Screen Factory and a lot of other DVD distributors and movie posters and t-shirt companies like Fright Rag. Um, that stuff keeps me pretty busy. So the, the movie stuff's really just my hobby. You know, I, I don't really call myself a director. Uh, when I do conventions and things, I don't say, you know, Nathan Dawes, my owner, filmmaker, because I really am a novice. I'm just trying to learn this stuff, and, and I've been doing, you know, I've been drawing since I was five, but I've been making movies for only about five or six, seven years, and nothing major, nothing really, really, I just feel like now I'm starting to re, uh, understand filmmaking better, because I've been working with a lot of other people 
who I feel are really talented people are going to make a, a big noise in the industry. I may not, but they will. Uh, I, I really believe in a lot of people I've got, like Kevin, uh, Kevin Roach, and uh, my DP and cinema, uh, cinematographer, uh, DP Bonnell, is an incredibly talented guy. Christine Renee Farley is this actress I've worked with, and she's, they're all destined for, for big things if they make the right choices and the right doors open for them. So I'm really enjoying working with these really talented people and learning from them and uh, just having fun. So that's basically what I got going on. Well, there you go. That is Nathan Thomas Milner.